My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap. We are here this evening to learn about sound awareness, how brains filter, process, and interpret noise with Dr. Kirupa Sudhaka, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the National Institutes of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, and also the National Institutes of Health. And uh, very pleased for all of you joining us here this evening. I know that there may be some new people who are here as a result of our collaboration with the Association for Research in Otolaryngology. Uh, this event is being hosted in collaboration with the ARO, who is the largest, world's largest organization of hearing and balance researchers. And it is through our collaboration with the ARO um, that we are able to provide a interpretation this evening. So very pleased to have our, uh, our interpreters here this evening. Um, the ARO is having their annual midwinter meeting coming up in the next week and uh, this was a special event, public event, that we are, are putting on as part of that meeting. So welcome any of you who are here from ARO and um, for those of you who didn't know about them, they are an institution that is pretty great. So thank you all. And for those of you who are new to us, a quick uh, introduction to Science on Tap. We are a science lecture series that is based in Portland, Oregon. And this picture is from the before times when we used to hold our uh, events in theaters. And hopefully we get hope to get back to that at some point. Um, but now we are hosting our events online and we've got two events per month. And uh, we are have a bunch scheduled, um, some of them coming up on the calendar here pretty soon, not on the website yet. But if you want to know more about what we have coming up, there's our website if you aren't already familiar with it. Have some neuroscience topics, some birds, um, have some other uh, well-known authors coming up soon as well. So keep an eye on that. And also, um, our goal is to make science accessible and meaningful for adults in particular. And um, we think that it's uh, nice to enjoy science with a, a, an adult beverage um, sometimes. So I'm drinking a, a pineapple cider, and I encourage any of you joining us this evening to, to have a beverage of your choice as well. We, as I mentioned, we've been doing two events per month, um, and we did a whole bunch last year, and you can find the recordings of those events on our YouTube page. Um, here are some of them. I couldn't fit all of them on there, but you can also find our podcast, which is called A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. Those episodes are also on our YouTube page, so check out what we have um, there. Lots of really great content. So now all of that Housekeeping is out of the way. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite our speaker to the stage. Again, this is Dr. Kirupa Sudhaka, who is going to be talking about sound. Take it away. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kirupa Sudhaka, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, thank you very much to Amanda for that fantastic introduction. Also, thank you to Amanda and the Science on Tap crew for um, and also the Association for Research in Otolaryngology, especially their External Relations Committee for inviting me to speak to you here today. I also want to um, say a big thank you to our ASL interpreters, Elise and Amanda, for being here and making sure that this event is accessible. So before we begin, I need to make a quick disclaimer that all of the opinions expressed in this talk are my own and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of NIH, NIDCD, or any of the past affiliations I've held to date. So when we talk about the brain, we often think in terms of what is relevant and what needs to be attended to. And today, what I'd like to do is to turn that idea on its head and instead talk about the irrelevant aspects of the world around us, that our brains expend an immense amount of energy to actively ignore. So in a sense, today, we're going to be making ourselves more aware of our ignorance. And before we get in, I think it's probably a good time to tell you a little bit about myself. So I have always been fascinated by perception. How is it that each of us can make sense of every single thing that's happening in the world around 
us, yet still be so individual that the same experience can have such different lasting effects on different people. Straight out of high school, I undertook my first undergraduate degree, which was in psychology and philosophy. And I thought that this, this degree path might kind of answer some of these questions for me. And, you know, to a certain extent it did. But at the end of those three years, I realized that what I wanted to do was to continue to study, but I wanted to ask questions that had answers. And the philosophical nature of that inquiry didn't quite come out in, in what I had done. So I went back and I did a second undergraduate degree in medical science, followed by an honors, a PhD, and currently on my second postdoc, all specializing in the field of auditory neuroscience. So I guess you could say that I kind of became enamored by the auditory system. And one of the things I love most about studying the auditory system is that on the one hand, it is so mathematical, the input, sound, can be so easily broken down into frequency and intensity components. But what our brains decide to do with that sound is just phenomenal. You know, it's, it is phenomenal that we can understand language or that you in the audience, some of you might not be familiar with my accent, but that doesn't prevent you from understanding what I'm saying. How our brains detect and perceive sound is just fascinating to me. And I wanted to also take a moment and tell you all just how much I enjoy this kind of science communication initiative. Things like this that sift through science to bring you bite-sized pieces of information about our current understanding of the world are very important. And the thing that I absolutely love about this meme, this cartoon that I've got up here at the moment, is how it completely captures the duality of scientific inquiry. So on the one hand, you have these interesting fundamental questions about the nature of the universe, about us, everything, you know, life. And on the other hand, you have the meticulous and monotonous quantitative work that is required to answer these questions. So my hope for this talk today is to do the exact opposite of what Principal Skinner is doing here. I wanna remove the tedium of sitting still, being quiet, writing down numbers and paying attention. And instead, I'd like to take you on a tour through the fascinating and overlooked task constantly performed by our brains. And I find that the best way or one of my favorite ways to start this discussion is to think about camouflage. So camouflage enables an organism to exploit the noise of its particular ecological niche for the purposes of disguise. This strategy isn't limited to a particular group of animals such as predator or prey species and can be successfully utilized in a number of different ways as illustrated in these examples here. So in the first case, we have an owl that's blending into a particular part of its environment, a tree trunk. The dappling of her feathers imitates the rough texture of the tree bark, and in the absence of a stiff breeze, it renders her invisible. In the second picture, we have a giraffe blending into its greater savanna environment. The yellow, brown, and orange hues uh, in this environment along with the long, thin, and windy tree trunks, provide the perfect coverage for her long orange and white wings. And finally, in the last picture, we have a leaf-tailed gecko exhibiting a form of mimicry to conceal itself out in the open. So in this case, she is hiding herself by becoming the environment around her. So for those of you who may be don't have good bit rates at the moment, or maybe the camouflage is working better than we'd like to uh, acknowledge. But here is our owl. Here is our giraffe. And here is our gecko. So in each of these cases, the adaptations that better disguise the individual directly improves its ability to thrive by either hiding it from a predator or prey. And so this brings us to 
the question of today's discussion. How do our brains know when something is something and not nothing? At what point does nothing become something and vice versa? So this cartoon depicts a situation that we are all familiar with, or at least we were more familiar with prior to the extended social isolation due to COVID. And that is maintaining a conversation in the presence of background noise. So you may have heard a situation like this being referred to in the past as the cocktail party effect. And that's being illustrated in this illustration. So Fred here, Fred's got a name tag on so we can identify him, is having a lovely conversation with white sweater and gray jacket. He hears a faint sound somewhere in the room and his brain has a really important decision to make. Does he continue the conversation with white sweater and gray jacket, or does he shift his attention? In this case, if the question mark were relevant information to Fred, it would be classified as a signal and attended to. However, if irrelevant, it should be deemed noise and ignored. So this concept of signals versus noise is one that we deal with every day, but we don't consciously think about it because our brains are such great filters. To build on this idea of signals versus noise, um, I love, uh, you're gonna find out during this talk that I love visual analogies. And so here's another one. This is one that I find works really well for this concept of signals in noise. And it is the puzzle book known as Where's Waldo? Or for our international audience members, Where's Wally? So in this case, we have a very clearly defined signal, Waldo or Wally, on the left here. And our task is to pick him out from the background noise of the other characters in the very busy fairground scene that we can see here on the right. So you might say to me, well, Kirapa, that's clearly unfair. In this case, our signal is so big. So if we scale Wally down to the size that he would be in this scene, we can see that the task of detecting a signal in the absence of background noise is much, much simpler than in the presence of background noise. And so for you completionists there in the audience who, um, who would be agitated if they didn't find Wally before we move on, I've got him highlighted here for you. So this is a schematic of the auditory system which starts at the ear and ends at the auditory cortex of the brain, which has been highlighted here in red. That's what this line is pointing to. This flowchart on the left is a really convenient way to conceptualize the neural processing that goes into perceiving a sound. So bottom up processing is depicted as this sort of ascending hierarchical progression from hearing the kind of detection of a signal through listening, comprehending, and reacting. On the other hand, top-down processing is depicted as a more dynamic process. And you can see that information travels between the stages of processing to form loops at different levels. So we can look at an anatomical analog of this kind of high level contextual processing. On the right here is a simplified representation of the auditory pathway. And I don't want you to worry too much about the different names, but focus more on the green boxes and the arrows. So the analogous ascending hierarchy is depicted with the black arrows as the signal, um, as the signal travels from the inner ear through the, through the brain to the cortex. It also contains an analogous top-down connection or series of top-down connections as illustrated with the thinner pink arrows, right? Now, typically when we think about assigning relevance to a sound, we'll focus on those attentional centers of our brain those higher order processing centers located in the cortex. 
But today, what I'd like to do is focus on some of the lower order processing and circuitry of the auditory system that enables our brains to filter out some of this noise before we are even aware of it. And to do that, because I love analogies so much, <clears throat> for those of us who are old enough to remember, I wanna take us back to the days when a television depended on having an antenna and a cathode ray tube. In that case, pure noise was directly equatable to a complete loss of signal. A poorly placed antenna results in a complete loss of signal, resulting in only static white noise, as illustrated in this GIF. Indeed, when I watch this GIF, in my head, all I can hear is that shh static that would usually accompany this screen. And so taking this analogy further, you would sometimes encounter a situation where you would get the antenna placement partially right, and you'd end up with a signal that looked more like this. So here we can make out that there's definitely a signal coming through. It's not just white noise. We can infer that this is probably a man wearing a suit, maybe moving his head, but the noise obscures who he is or what he's doing. And when we consider the auditory system, it's this, this concept of discussing signals and noise is particularly relevant. And that's because we are constantly bombarded with environmental sounds. A task as innocuous as standing in your kitchen and quietly reading through a new recipe prior to getting your hands dirty. You'll likely encounter the buzz of a fridge or a fan, cars or animals in the distance. There will be some level of noise. You know, even before we wake up, our ears are on, detecting sounds in the environment that are relevant to us, such as our alarm clocks. Some of us are lucky enough to have the warm furry variety pictured here. Others have to make do with the more mechanical kind. But the majority of us rely on sound to wake up. In the second case here, we have a situation where a red panda is not aware of the approaching zookeeper and he responds to this threatening life or death situation in the manner appropriate only to a red panda. And, you know, it's all well and good to giggle at this guy here. But if we stop and think for a moment, and, you know, we actually consider this panda's response, the lack of an appropriate assessment of its local environment caused it to react in a way that was incommensurate to the threat response. The perceived threat was far greater than the actual threat. And what this is actually doing is illustrating to us just how important this environmental feedback is in shaping our responses to the world. So in addition to being constantly on, our auditory system is built to detect sounds over volumes spanning several orders of magnitude. So I want you to imagine the gentle pitter-patter of raindrops on a lazy summer afternoon. <clears throat> so calm you could almost drift off to sleep. Then I want you to fast forward to a few hours later when that understated sun shower turns into a full-blown summer storm. Complete with lightning flashes illuminating the sky, thunder that you can feel in your bones, all of it. The range of intensities we can hear is illustrated here with examples of everyday sounds depicted above. Already, we can appreciate, we don't need to look at this chart to appreciate how much louder a jet engine is compared to the gentle rustle of leaves. So sound intensity is measured on a decibel scale, as shown here, where zero represents the theoretical threshold of hearing or softest sound your ears can detect. And each dB is a representation of a fold increase. So based on the definition of dB used for sound pressure level, I'm going to pro provide you with a, 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 quick, a quick tip for how to kind of understand this contextually. You can divide dB by 20 to get a quick approximation of the orders of magnitude greater than hearing that that sound is. So for example, the sound of a helicopter is five orders of magnitude or 10,000 times greater than the softest sound you could feasibly hear, while the threshold of pain is seven orders of magnitude 
right open here. So sound is a complex stimulus, and we can break it down into smaller pieces to consider it in further detail. Here's the original non-stylized version of the title picture screen I had, the title screen picture, sorry, I had up before. And so this type of image is called a spectrogram. And that is basically a visual representation of how the properties of sound, such as frequency and intensity, vary over time. So in a few moments, I'm going to play this recording and we're gonna hear a cacophony of birds squawking to anyone in the vicinity of my parents' house in Sydney, Australia. So I've included a few pictures of some of the major players here on the right. Um, these are all native Australian birds. But for the purposes of um, today's talk, it's not important that you know whose song belongs to who. Um, what we're going to do is just when I play uh, the clip so that you can follow along a bit better at home, um, I provided this vertical line that's going to travel along here um, on the time axis for you. So here we go. <laughs> So I, I think we all get the, get the idea here. So over the course of this recording, we heard fluctuations in the frequency or pitch and the intensity or volume. Both of those um, were encoded in this spectrogram. So we could see those fluctuations as we could hear them. You probably also noticed a couple of other things. So spatially, it sounded like some of the birds were sitting right next to the microphone while others were pretty far away. Some were literally plonked, just sitting, while others were moving around and competing with others for the choicest fruit. And so it's clear that sound contains many different features, which our brains must process. But what exactly is it? Well, sound is just mechanical vibrations. Here we can see the strings of a guitar being plucked to produce sound pressure waves in air. Each guitar string vibrates at a different frequency. The top strings are vibrating at higher frequencies and the bottom strings are vibrating at lower frequencies. So the summation of all of these different frequencies plus whatever background noise is um, in the acoustic scene is gonna result in the production of this complex waveform uh, similar to what we heard in the previous example of bird calls. And so this complex waveform is illustrated here in black. The pinner funnels sound through the ear canal, which causes vibrations of the eardrum. This energy is converted to a mechanical pressure wave through this, the three small bones of the acicular chain, which are known as the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So a fun fact is that the stapes is actually the smallest bone in the body. And so the minuscule movements of this bone in the order of nanometers are still sufficient to cause pressure waves through the hearing organ, which is called the cochlea. And the reason why is because of the size difference between the area of the eardrum and the area of the foot plate of the stapes. So the ratio of these two different areas optimizes energy transfer when passing from air to fluid through bone. 
So the cochlea, which is Greek for snail, is a bony spiral housing, which encases three fluid filled cavities, as we can see illustrated in this 3D virtual cross section of a cadaveric human cochlea. So physical movement of the stapes causes pressure waves to travel along this spiral as indicated with the blue arrows here. While not strictly in the brain, these hair cells are the detectors that translate the vibrations or pressure waves into electrical signals that can be understood and transmitted onwards by neurons. So here we have a single cross section through the cochlea illustrating the three fluid filled cavities, each known as scalar. So remember that the organ of corti forms a sheet. And I find a good analogy for this is those spiral decorations that you can find in party supply shops as I've got illustrated here. So if we were to imagine looking through the spiral, there would be a particular point where you would catch the horizontal plane of this spiral at multiple points. And that's what's shown in this picture here. So if we zoom in on this region that I've drawn your attention to, we can see the organ of cordy. Here is the tectoral membrane. Don't worry too much about these terms. I'm just pointing them out for those of you who might know or be interested in, in, in a bit more. So uh, here we can see the tectoral membrane, the basal membrane, a bunch of different supporting cells. And the cells that we're interested in are these two types of hair cells. Um, the inner hair cell is considered sensory and the outer hair cell is considered motile. And so in this illustration or GIF, we can actually see the sound pressure wave traveling along the basal membrane causing displacement of the stereocilia. So these tiny little hairs on top of the hair cells. Um, and this results in the hair cells to signal that they detected a vibration. They signal this to the spiral ganglion neurons, which are highlighted here in blue um, and are connected to the bottom of these hair cells. So these spiral ganglion neurons then convey the electrical signals to the central auditory system and make up the auditory nerve. So this description of the cochlea makes it sound like the cochlea is this kind of passive receiving device, but that's not the case. In fact, these outer hair cells, uh, which are thought of motor or more accurately described as electromotile, um, because that refers to their ability to change their length in a voltage dependent manner. So here's an example of a single outer hair cell dynamically changing its length. In this GIF, what we're doing is we're looking down on the organ of corti, um, down in this direction. And so what we can see is a single row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. Um, and so what you can clearly appreciate in this GIF here compared to this isolated um, outer hair cell is that when, we, when these cells move in tandem, the effect is quite large. And so this outer hair cell motion results in something called cochlear amplification. And that ultimately increases the sharpness of frequency tuning. And we'll get into a bit, we'll get into that in a bit more detail shortly. So in the meantime, to better visualize this connection between the cochlear hair cells and the brain via these spiral ganglion neurons, we're gonna look at a series of stained histological slices through the skull of a mouse. We're gonna spend some time on this slide, so feel free to have a sip of beer, sit back, and settle in while I walk you through it. And before we dive in, I've, I've got these two um, illustrations to orient you to what we're gonna be looking at. So in both cases, the orange arrows are showing you that our, our direction of view is that we have a bird's eye view. We're looking down on top of the, of the brain and skull. So the sections we're going to see are called horizontal sections because they have been cut in this horizontal orientation. It's actually going to be a GIF that comes up. And so what it's going to do is bounce between the topmost or dorsal section and the bottommost or ventral section and just keep bouncing back and forward while we, while we watch. 
So in this, in this top panel, um, we can see the orientation from the side of the horizontal sections. And this second depiction here, which is kind of cool because it's actually a micro CT scan of um, a, a, a 3D reconstruction of a mouse skull viewed from the back. Um, so basically the same direction that I'm facing. So in this case, the right cochlea is highlighted in red. And so I'm gonna click forward and we can see the brain slices. So the stain used in these slices is known as a hematoxylin and eosin or h &E stain. And that stains the cell bodies, the cell nuclei blue and other cellular and extracellular components components can be visualized in different shades of pink. So in this view, you can see that the bone has been left intact and it is visible as these kind of solid magenta lines encasing this deeper purple tissue, which would be marrow. And so within this brain, we can see um, the brain stem, which is this kind of large pink area here. And we can also see the cerebellum, um, it, which is coming up here, down here, and consists of this kind of lighter pink and also this kind of darker purple color. So I've roughly outlined the cochleas on both sides in blue, so you can see the progression going down through the cochlea and back up. And so what you can appreciate is that at a particular point, this bone, known as the oticapsule, that encases the cochlea, it opens up to allow the spiral ganglion neurons which are actually located in the spiral of the cochlea. And that's why they, that's how they get their name because ganglion refers to um, a bundle of neurons and the bundle of these spiral ganglion neurons spiral through the cochlea. And so when they exit the cochlea, they exit out this little hole that's made in the otic capsule. And so we'll see them here, they come. Um, and so they're coming out. Um, so they're exiting the cochlea and entering the brain. So as the spiral ganglions, spiral ganglion neurons enter the brain as um, the auditory nerve, they bring with it the electrical signals that are encoding the sound signals at those hair cells. So far, we've discussed what sound is and how it is transduced into an electrical signal and transported to the brain via these spiral ganglion neurons. Now the term afferent, which derives from the Latin meaning towards, is used to refer to information traveling from the periphery, from the cochlea to the brain. In the last slide, we saw that horizontal sections, we saw some horizontal sections through the brain, but for the purposes of viewing the entire ascending auditory system, it's a lot more convenient to view the brain by slicing it vertically to give what's known as coronal sections as illustrated here. And before we dive in further, I wanted to take a moment to remind everyone, give everyone a quick refresher on what neurons are and how they work. So neurons are a specialized type of cell that consists of a soma or cell body, um, dendrites and axons. So neurons primary, primarily talk to each other using synapses, which are specialized neurochemical exchange sites. So synapses are formed by the axon terminals of a presynaptic neuron and the, typically the dendrites of a postsynaptic neuron. Changes in the electrical potential, known as action potentials, result in the release of neurotransmitter at these synapse sites by the presynaptic neuron. This neurotransmitter binds to specialized receptor proteins in the postsynaptic neuron, and these can I, and this kind of binding can either increase or decrease the probability of an action potential in the postsynaptic cell. And so, on a very basic level, this is how communication between neurons works. And one thing to remember is that typically there is a direction of information flow. Information is received at the dendrites and um, passed on forward through the axon. So specific features of sound, such as frequency, loudness, timing, and localization are processed as this signal ascends the various nuclei of the central auditory system 
en route to the auditory cortex where the perception of sound occurs. And we spoke a little bit about frequency before while we were discussing the spectrogram of bird sounds. And frequency is a really important um, idea because as you can expect, being such a large component of sound, it's a really prominent feature in the ascending auditory system. So earlier we saw how different guitar strings could produce different frequencies. Here we have another musical instrument analogy, a piano. So similar to striking different strings on a guitar, by pressing down on different keys of the piano, the instrument will produce notes of different frequencies or pitch from low to high, or high to low, depending on which way you're going. Um, and so this spatial arrangement of frequency is known as chronotopy. Um, and it's a ubiquitous feature in the auditory system. And so what we've got here on top of the piano is a graphical representation of the spiral of the cochlea. And so you can see that different frequencies are encoded at different locations along the spiral. So imagine that you take this keyboard and you roll it up to form a coil with each key representing a hair cell. That's a really convenient way to think about how the cochlea encodes different frequencies based on location. And what's cool about the auditory system is that it isn't just the cochlea that has this tonotopic organization. So remember, we've seen this kind of cross-sectional view through the cochlea before. And what we have here are the location of two different spiral ganglion neurons um, that are touching hair that are contacting hair cells at, um, at different regions of the cochlea. So this one is in the more basal region of the cochle cochlea, and this red guy is in the more apical region of the cochlea. And so in addition to these spiral ganglion neurons being positioned with respect to frequency, um, this kind of uh, tonotopic distribution of cells occurs all the way up the ascending auditory pathway. So frequency organization is retained. Another aspect of the auditory system that's pretty phenomenal is timing. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at a few videos of real data that was obtained during my postdoctoral appointment in the Lieberman lab in, um, at the Eaton Peabody Laboratories in, um, in, in Boston. And so these data show the responses of two different cells from the same region of the brain responding to an identical stimulus. The response that we're measuring here is the change in electrical potential so that action potential that occurs in response to a sound stimulation. And before I start the sound, um, I wanna just let you know uh, what we're gonna see. We're gonna see a bunch of spontaneous action potentials that kind of randomly pop up here and there. And then when I turn the sound on, uh, uh, so the sound itself is a 50 millisecond long uh, noise burst and it's presented at a rate of 10 times per second. And so before I actually play the video, just to, to let you guys know, this panel here is showing the same data from this panel here. Um, it's just overlaying each of these action potentials and widening the scale so that you can see um, the, how consistent the shape is. So I'm gonna start it now. And so you, you can see these little dots. This is when the sound gets turned on and when the sound gets turned off. So let's have a look. going to come on soon. So you can clearly appreciate that, okay, so I should first tell you that in this video, we have the time down here. And remember I said that it's a 50 millisecond tone, uh, 50 millisecond um, sound stimulus. So the sound is on during this period and then the sound is off during this period. And you can all probably appreciate that the number of action potentials, the number of spikes that occurs in the sound on time 
is significantly greater than the number of spikes that occurs in the sound off time. So I'll just bring that forward and play it again so you can, you can see what you're looking for. So another way we can represent this kind of data visually that doesn't require a video is using something called a dot raster plot, which is illustrated here. In this case, each of these dots refers to a, the timing of a single action potential. Each of the rows refers to a presentation of the 50 millisecond sound. And so what you can see over the course of 150 presentations of this sound, this neuron is really is doing a really good job of encoding when the sound is on and when the sound is not. And so one of the ways that the auditory system is able to accomplish such an incredible feat of timing is through very, very um, specific anatomical specialization. And so one of those is shown here. This is known as the end bulb of hell, and it is a complex net-like structure. So earlier we spoke about how one neuron talks to another neuron, um, but at its axon and dendrite um, connections. And what we can see here is that the presynaptic neuron is effectively face hugging the postsynaptic neuron to ensure that it knows when to respond, okay? And so this is just one of, um, one of many uh, cool anatomical um, ways for this to happen. But before I move on, I wanna just kind of drill home the point of timing by showing you a video of a different neuron type in response to the identical cell simulation. And so this neuron is just, is, is recorded from, from this portion of the brainstem. It's not very far at all from the one we just saw. And so when I play this video, you're immediately gonna see the response to this neuron is substantially different from the one we saw in the last side, slide. So again, this stimulus is a 50 millisecond noise burst presented at 10 times per second. And this time, when we watch the video, instead of focusing on the, the software screen, I'm gonna let the video continue until it, um, it shows the oscilloscope screen, which I'll talk you through in more detail. So sound will come on. And so this is a really cool, um, a cool um, view to look at because what we can see here are three different signals. In the yellow, we have our, uh, our sound signal that goes for 50 milliseconds. In the green, we have our neuron response and we can see that that action potential occurs with very short latency. The sound, remember, this is 50 milliseconds long, right? The neuron responds almost immediately almost every time. This, this image um, also shows the EKG of, um, of the animal that we're recording the neuron from. So this neuron is predictably referred to as an onset neuron because it responds once at the onset of the sound and once only. And so basically what I hope that these two videos have illustrated to you all is that timing can be encoded differently by different classes of auditory neurons, but it is really important for the entire auditory system. So coming back to this box diagram simplification of the auditory system that we saw earlier, Remember that those descending connections from the higher brain regions like the cortex were illustrated, um, were represented using these pink arrows. So we also saw this diagram earlier, but now I wanna draw your attention to a new portion of the diagram here labeled efferent. 
So these auditory efferents, which are indicated in the arrows here in green, um, are going to be the primary focus for the rest of my talk. So taken again, taken from the Latin meaning away from, the term auditory efferent refers to neurons that are located in the brain and send information to the cochlea. So what I want you to notice is that efferent neurons also receive information from other regions in the brain, including the cortex, the midbrain, and even local connections within the brainstem. And so what this does is it basically gives different brain regions the ability to feed back to the cochlea via these auditory efferents. So ultimately, this means that the brain can actually control the sound signal that is received both before and after it is perceived by the brain. How does that work? Well, auditory efferents modulate afferent activity via a sound evoked negative feedback loop. I'm going to unpackage that statement for everyone because it's it's a little dense. So basically what this means is that auditory efferents receive information about sound from the afferents and then they use that information to decrease the afferent activity. So this schematic illustrates one portion of the efferent reflex innervating the right cochlea. And that's why we only really have the panel for the organ of Cordy on the right here. So sound input is, arrives at both ears and is conveyed by the afferent spiral ganglion neurons. And then the second aut auditory neuron in the brainstem that we're not gonna go into for the purposes of this talk. Um, so the signal is conveyed by the spiral ganglion neuron and the second um, neuron um, to the region where the auditory efferent cell bodies are located, here where the arrows end. So the auditory neur efferent neurons then send information back out to the outer hair cells, re reducing their ability to perform that cochlear amplification that we spoke about earlier. What this ultimately does is inhibit that afferent activity. So in a similar manner to how we can record changes in an electrical, in an electrical potential in a single neuron as individual action potentials, we can also record the summed changes in electrical potential from all of the spiral ganglion neurons using something known as the compound action potential. And that's what I'm showing in this panel here. So these two kind of characteristic waveforms coming out of the baseline are what tell us that the spiral ganglion neurons are responding to sound. And if you're wondering why this data looks like it's from the 50s, it's because this paper was published in 1956. In this paper, they record these compound action potentials in response to sound. They then activate the auditory efferents using a short electrical stimulation and record that same compound action potential. So here we can appreciate that the response, those two waveforms in response to sound completely disappears when the efferents are activated. Now remember that the only difference between these two panels is the activation of efferents. So the obvious question is, why would the brain build in a short circuit? Why would it want to incapacitate itself in a system that is designed to transduce, to detect, to send information about sound to the brain? Why? Well, what a surprise. We're gonna answer that question by looking at some um, visual analogies. So I want you to consider the situation where a blinding bright light is um, is is shone at you. Maybe you've just you've just woken up and some horrible soul has pulled pulled the curtains open. Something happens. You know you have you have multiple different ways that you can respond to this stimulus to protect yourself from the excess. And you know our our ears 
don't have e-lids, as I, as I said just shortly before this. There is no way to turn this off. And one way to think about this is a crying baby. Oh, this poor guy is unhappy. He is unhappy for some reason. And the sound, I mean, I don't know about you, but I watch that gif and I can hear him. I can hear his unhappiness. But you know what? You know who would really hear him? His mum, who's holding him right here and has his mouth right by her ear. Now, she's not going to say, oh, that's loud. I should put my hands over my ears. And so she's being, um, she's kind of being, she's, she's being hit by quite a loud sound. And so in this way, having the efferents modulate the efferent, uh, the afferent activity, sorry, we can get protection from excess. Similarly, um, I want you to think about a situation where a seemingly inocula innocuous sound has become overbearing. Um, so I, I love this one. If you've ever been in the vicinity of a very loud masticator, um, you know, you, it's one of those things you never thought someone chewing could be that loud, but then it just starts and doesn't stop. It's the same for a, for a dripping tap, you know, this tap might have been dripping for four hours and you finally realize that it's dripping and those last five minutes of trying to find where it's coming from are the, most, are the worst. But it's those four hours where you didn't realize or it wasn't deemed important enough for you um, that we're most considered, that we're most worried about here. And so these efferents can also come into play in this kind of situation. And so I think, I think now's a good, good time. I really like this gift because I feel like it does a really good job of explaining the why, right? So here we have the cochlear amplifier doing all of this work to ensure that our listening experience or surfing experience in this particular case is going to be the best that it can be. And coming in from the sides here, side here, we have the efferents that have the luxury of having all of this top-down information. And they can just come in and say, oh, no, you're doing too much. No, 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 pull it back. And so that's basically what this system is. It's this push-pull of making sure that the auditory system is going to operate in the right kind of range for the organism at that point in time. And so I've spent a lot of time focusing on this kind of concept of bottom-up processing um, and top-down processing. And I spent a lot of time focusing on, on kind of what's going on at this lower level. And before I leave you today, I want to just kind of really, really quickly touch on this higher level because it is the stuff that is interesting to us. Right. And how I want to talk, talk to you about this is um, I want to bring up this article that was published a few years ago. And I'm going to play you a, um, a, 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 a sound clip of the stimulus that they used in, in this paper. And so this, this study basically was looking at context-dependent speech intelligibility. And so the sound clip we're going to hear um, it consists of four different phrases. Each phrase is repeated three times. The first time the phrase is repeated, there is a significant amount of noise that is obstructing the listener from understanding the speech. The second time the clip is uh, played, for the second um, presentation, there is no noise. The third presentation is the noisy clip again. So I'm just going to let it play and, uh, and we can all just uh, experience it. Bagpipes and bongos are musical instruments. Bagpipes and bongos are musical instruments. Bagpipes and bongos are musical instruments. The high security person was running my warm water. The high security prison was surrounded by barbed wire. The high security prison was surrounded by barbed wire. 
The full moon shone brightly that night. The full moon shone brightly that night. Move the garbage nearer to the large window. Move the garbage nearer to the large window. Move the garbage nearer to the large window. Okay, so for, for those of you who didn't get it, I'm just going to, because I know this is actually a very difficult task for people with hearing loss to, um, to accomplish. And so basically what happened, um, so what would have happened for most people uh, is that after having the context of what the speech was in the second presentation, the third presentation of that jumbled kind of incoherent speech suddenly became coherent. And this is an example of this kind of top down level of processing and attention and kind of the, the complexity of everything that's required to give us this full understanding of speech and noisy environments um, and, and really uh, understand the world around us. And so with that, I'm gonna, this is gonna be my last, uh, last picture that I'm gonna show you. And so what I hope that we've accomplished today is that, you know, I found this picture and just thought it was hilarious that um, this idea that the auditory system is the organ of corti connected by the single wire to the auditory cortex. And I hope what I've, I've shown you today is that there is much, more, much, much more to the auditory system than just kind of a, um, an aux cable connecting the cochlea from the, to the brain. And so I hope you'll appreciate that there is a, a lot of complex pre-processing and um, continuous processing that, um, that is involved in our auditory system that is kind of necessary for um, allowing us to hear in a meaningful manner. And so with that, I'm going to finish and ask if I'm going to thank you all for listening. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'll ask if there's any questions. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. We have a lot of people who have responded that the, the last uh, clip you played wasn't creepy at all. Um, <laughs> awesome. those, those voices are a little, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know that it creeps some people out and other people are just like, oh yeah, I've had phone calls that sound like this before. <laughs> so my, I uh, have a lot of questions. A um, couple that are, are along the same lines are, you, you mentioned about the, the dripping faucet or the, the loud chewing and whatnot. And uh, another person mentioned that, you know, if you're in a, she was in a grocery store and could hear somebody talking that was very loud and abrasive and it didn't seem to bother other people, but it was really annoying to her. Is there a way short of maybe walking away or putting in earplugs that, that you can deal with that? Obviously you were talking about how the, the signals are trying to um, dampen that, but what else can you do? Yeah, that's an interesting question because it really depends on a couple of things. Like for an abrasive voice, is it abrasive because it reminds you of someone abrasive? Is it actually, you know, contextual that you're feeling this way or does it actually have to do with this person's abrasive voice? Um, and so, the, I mean, one of the things you can do is you could, you could find a fan to just go and stand next to and try and mask some of that. Um, try and introduce noise to, to confuse your auditory system about the thing that is annoying you. Um, but I think one of the other things you could consider is, is potentially using kind of um, uh, like anxiety related strategies to reduce the, um, not so much the sound, but the impact that the sound is having on you is what I would kind of suggest in that situation. 
I, I just want to mention, um, I'm, I know I'm on screen and I'm looking off to the side. I'm looking for more questions on my computer that's sitting over here. So in case anyone is interested, um, that's why I'm looking away. Um, so why, you kind of talked about this already, but is there, are there sounds that are objectively pleasant or abrasive you know that i'm thinking of um nails on a chalkboard is something that that i think if you polled most of the people in the audience if they've seen a chalkboard recently um they might think that that was an abrasive sound that makes your skin crawl what is that all about so i think there are a couple of things about this one of them is that you know we have this massive range of frequencies that we can hear over but the kind of the typical frequencies that you get every day are kind of limited to this kind of um, smaller band. And so I think things like nails on a chalkboard or styrofoam, nails on a chalkboard isn't too bad for me, but styrofoam, I can't do styrofoam. Um, I think that some of, some of the things related to why they are so aversive is that they exist in this range that, that we don't typically hear. And so one, um, one thing that kind of always gets to me when I work, because I work in, in the field, I'm always hearing kind of pure tones at different frequencies. And when you hear a very high frequency tone, even if it's not very loud, the sensation, I don't know if you get the same thing, but the sensation to me is, it, it feels different somehow. And so I think that part of it could be that. Um, and I think, Another part of it, again, is going to be context dependent. So that experience of when you heard nails on a chalkboard, it probably wasn't a very fun time. And so maybe you're just associating that sound with um, or those kinds of the sounds that are in the same kind of range to that kind of aversive experience. Yeah, it, it makes me think of um, using a, another analogy. I know you're fond of visual analogies, but as a, a scent analogy, um, it, certain kinds of cheeses might smell really bad if you just smelled them out of context. Whereas if you're having a cheese plate and you like that, then it's great. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and even then in that case, it's, it's personal preference, right? Some people love foot cheese and other people just can't. So... <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm on the fence about that, but that's another talk. Um, <laughs> so um, some questions, and and I know that we spoke earlier um, about how you are not an expert in in tinnitus or tinnitus, um, and and weren't going to have any sort of um, clinical uh, discussions or or didn't have any clinical information. But I had somebody ask a question about um, hyperacusis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and she said that she has both hyperacusis and tinnitus um, and is one mechanical, one brain function. Can you explain a little bit about that? You know, I wish I could. And the reason why I can't is because we simply don't know. We have a lot of ideas and there's a lot of funding that's going into trying to find um, the kind of generator of tinnitus because it affects a lot of people and it's one of, it's similar to kind of mental illness. It's one of those hidden diseases where people have to kind of, pardon the pun, but suffer in silence because there's nothing that we can do to help them. And so I'm not sure that there's much I can I can give you to help you specifically, but um, what I can kind of potentially say is that there are a lot of ideas about how um, how the percept of tinnitus is is being generated, and I think that there are a lot of cool questions that come out of that as well. And so one of them is that you know you might have after exposure to noise you could have, so I kind of alluded, I spoke about neurons and I alluded to the fact that an action potential can increase or decrease uh, or um, at a synapse, once you have that communication, you either increase or decrease the probability of having an action potential. And so the way that that happens is that you can have excitation of the cell or you can have inhibition of the cell. And so one basically pushes the cell more towards an action potential and the other less towards an action potential. And so what one, one theory is that when you have 
kind of excessive noise, you have noise trauma that leads to damage. And so there's a reduction in the excitation in the system and the system con compensates with inhibition. And so when you, when you, you change this kind of ratio of excitation to inhibition, there's this idea that maybe there's kind of like this reflexive hyperactivity in the system and that's what's kind of causing these, these phantom sounds. So that's kind of one way that it might be thought about that there's this, because we have this system that is so dynamic and constantly talking to each other, when you have some damage, it tries to make up for it and what it's doing is not actually doing anything um, useful for the organism. So that's kind of one, one um, kind of pathway that research is going down. Um, and I think that it's difficult as well because there's no one thing that is tinnitus. What is tinnitus? One person's tinnitus is not another person's tinnitus and one person's hyperacusis is not another person's. And I think that's kind of part of the difficulty. And another part of the difficulty is that you know, most of what we gain about all of this is gained from animal models. And we can't ask an animal if it's got tinnitus. We can't ask an animal, how loud is that sound? Um, we're getting, you know, we're getting be better techniques that are allowing us to ask much, much more difficult questions. But I think that it is, it is um, one, of the, one of the things that makes kind of hearing and auditory science is so cool. That communication aspect is what makes it, gives it that additional layer of complexity when you're trying to bring therapeutics to people because there's that additional aspect that you can't get from working with that um, experimental models. We've had a couple of questions and I'm going to sort of try and meld them together. Um, a couple of questions about noise at a party when parties were things we could do. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to hear somebody, even if you're trying to focus on them, or sometimes, um, you, you know, you're in a crowded room and then you suddenly hear your name or something. And, and I, I recognize that some of that may be um, a, a hearing loss issue um, if you are are having trouble um, recognizing or, or understanding somebody directly in front of you. But can you talk a little bit about noise and filtering and, and how that might affect or how, how somebody can deal with that? Yeah, I think that, like, again, it's, it's complex because you have basically what you're trying to do is um, you have multiple streams of information and you're trying to give each of them a little bit of focus to determine which one is the most important. And it's, it's a difficult task. And I think that there are a number of things that can make that more difficult. And so there are kind of the practical aspects of it. So if you're at a party and you're kind of standing up against a wall, then the sound's gonna reverberate off the wall and, um, and straight into your ear. And that's going to be, that's gonna make it really difficult for you to localize. So on, on a practical level, where you're standing in a noisy room is going to affect your perception of what's going on in that noisy room. Because it's not like sound just goes in one direction and, and stops there. It travels and it bounces back and forth. And um, so with respect to how you might be able to make things better if you're experiencing that kind of thing, that might be the easiest one. Just kind of change your behavior. Where are you standing? Don't stand next to the speakers. That kind of thing could help. Um, and so, on, on, on the other, on the other side, on the kind of the the um, neural processing side, again, we have to consider the context. If um, so, um, when I gave the example of Fred, if if that if that. If he hears someone say Fred in a room full of Freds, it's not going to be as important as someone saying Fred in a room full of non-Freds. And so I think that that context is always there. Um, and so in a party, in a party kind of environment, um, if the question is, why do you hear your name called? Probably because you're primed to listen for your name more frequently than anything else. Um, um, an, an interesting kind of follow on from that question is if you were in a noisy party, would you hear your mum calling your name over 
a random person calling your name. And I think those are the kinds of things too. Like if you have a common name, do you hear it a lot? I think sometimes some of this gets to like other, other kind of weird phenomena, phenomenon that happen. Like how many times do you kind of go for your phone and then it starts to ring or vibrate? Like um, I think that part of it is just kind of the, the kind of whimsical fun of life, <laughs> if it were. It, it also sounds perhaps a little bit like selection bias. Yeah, I definitely say so. And I say this because uh, like my name is Kirabob. People call me a bunch of things. My family have a nickname for me. Um, a lot of people just call me K because it's easier. And in certain environments, I don't respond to things. So if my parents call me K, I don't respond. If my parents call me by my name, I don't respond. I respond when they call me by my nickname because that's what I am primed for. Um, and so I think that there are there are all these layers when it comes to, and I think I, I was very um, particular about not talking too much about speech and I was talking about signals and noise because we've got to remember that this, this idea of just straight signals and noise, kind of white noise or party noise or background noise, it's a very different task to speech in noise. Um, speech in noise requires a lot more engagement of, of different um, of different brain areas than understanding just a straight tone. That relates to something I have experienced, and, and we got a couple questions about this, where um, listening to the radio in the background uh, and, and doing some work is fine, but listening to TV or listening to music that has words in it as opposed to instrumental while you're trying to mm. think and do work. Um, it sounds like this is a, a similar thing, that there's just too many things going through the same processes. Well, I think what it is is the brain's trying to be smart about uh, about making sure that it's attending to the right type of information. And I'm going to expand on what you just said by saying, like, how many times have you been in a car looking for an address and you turn down the radio, right? And this is because our sensory systems talk to each other and they can talk to each other in, in, in such a way that they um, prevent one from, from working as well as it should, or they enhance them both from, uh, to do a better job. And so I think one of the things that has come out of research recently is that the auditory and visual systems often compete when it comes to attention. And often the auditory system wins out because it, it is faster, um, it is more of an alarm sense. Um, and so there is a lot, of, a lot of research to be done on just how these two systems interact and how, how much um, how much that interaction then is, um, is kind of modulated based on the context in that situation. We've had several questions. Um, and this might be related to audio processing for folks with um, ADHD and, and how um, they're well, any any comments on that? Oh, I know that there has been uh, a lot done. I am not familiar with the literature, so I couldn't comment about it. I know that there's been a, quite, a, quite a substantial amount done with ADHD, uh, autism, and schizophrenia. And I think that part of it is that um, perhaps because the auditory system does rely on so much pre-processing of the signal, and if these disorders are related to you know disorders in 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 um, related uh, neural circuitry, um, is it that it is just a flow-on effect, or is it that there are some very specific um, uh, uh, detriments re with, re with with respect to the auditory system and um, and um, each of these? the drivers of each of these different um, types of diseases. So I think it's a, a really, really interesting um, area of research, but unfortunately I don't have a lot of comment on it. 
we have done uh, several talks in the past, including last week on, on neuroscience and music. And there was a question um, asking about processing music and, and how, can you speak to anything related to how uh, music can inspire emotion, either positive or negative? Oh, wow. Um, I, oh. I would recommend you look into, there's a few researchers who I know are doing um, this kind of, um, this kind of work. So there's, uh, I believe, Professor or Dr. Charles Lim um, and uh, Dr. Mo Monita Chatterjee are looking into this kind of um, music and uh, emotion work. And they also work with uh, cochlear implant um, um, patients. And so if you're interested in more of that, I highly recommend looking into those two people. Um, Dr. Lim actually has a TED talk that you can watch that is phenomenal. He is a musician himself. And as much as I would love to say that I got into um, auditory science because I am a trained musician, unfortunately, I do not have a musical brain in my body. Um, so it is a fascinating, and I mean, you know, especially coming from a psychology background, the idea of music is so, so, and how we do it, like, it's not just language, it's, it's language plus, you know, um, and so, yeah, they're definitely interesting questions, and I, I really, I think this is a fantastic time to, to be alive and to be a scientist, because there is so many technological advan advances that enable us to answer these questions that have been around since the 50s, you know? Um, you know, it's a really, it's a really cool time to be interested in science. I agree. Uh, the, I have a couple other questions and then we're gonna wrap up here. Um, just kind of a basic question. How does a cochlear implant work? Ah, oh, so this is a great question. So we went through um, a lot of the anatomy of, um, of what was going on. And I think it was pretty clear that um, the hair cells are where that, where sound goes from being a pressure wave to an electrical signal. At the base of the, of the hair cell, when the spiral ganglion um, neuron uh, receives that, that, um, that uh, neurotransmitter to say, I have, my, my stereocilia have deflected it's going to fire. And so cochlear implants work by utilizing that electrical nature of signal transduction. And so when somebody has a cochlea and doesn't have functional hair cells, if they still have the spiral ganglion neurons, you basically bypass the hair cell and you stick an electrode right up against that spiral ganglion neuron. And instead of the hair cell telling it, electrically, oh, I've detected something, you have the electrode take its place. And so the cochlear implant works by using, I think the most, or the, the largest one you can get has, I think, 21 electrodes on it. And so basically, basically it utilizes that spatial frequency orientation in the cochlea. And so each of the electrodes will activate a different frequency. And so you can obviously imagine that you know, our ears, our, our hair cells, we have, I think we have 10,000 or something. If you can imagine a piano that has 10,000 keys, right? And then you take that piano and you leave 22 behind. That's how a cochlear implant is working. It is utilizing those 22 electrodes to activate just 22 portions of that cochlea is enough to give you a sensation and sound. And that's in the in the highest case. There are many cochlear implant electrodes that are shorter than that, so you would have um, less resolution. And this is one of the reasons why music is so difficult to appreciate here. But cochlear implant users also have difficulties with timing and vocalization and a bunch of other um, a bunch of other um, perceptual tasks. So uh, it's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. I have another question about perception. 
Uh, my brother has had a sudden hearing loss in his right ear for no reason that they could find. And so now he has a, a hearing aid on his right ear and that, that transmits over to his left ear. Um, and it, it, say again. Is this a Baja? Um, I don't know. A bone anchored hearing device? Uh, no, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, the, my, my question is about, um, he can't tell where sound is coming from. And I, 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 can you talk a little bit about directionality in our ears? I sure can. It is a fascinating um, area. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because my mom actually has the same thing. She spontaneously just heard a pop one day and she could no longer hear. Um, and it was one of the things that kind of, one of the things that made me extra excited to get into this field. But sound localization is really interesting. And one of the things that I didn't talk about at all is the fact that we typically have two ears. And so the way that sound localization works is that you have two ears and input from both of those ears. And so your brain can calculate if a sound comes from this side, it's going to hit this ear before it hits this ear. Remember how much I focused on the timing differences? The fact that it hits this ear, even you know, microseconds before this ear is enough for our brains to calculate that difference and say it's closer to this side. Another, another thing that can happen is, is kind of your head shadow. Um, so if you have a sound coming from this side, it's going to, be, going to be louder on this side than it is on this side. And so basically the way that we localize is by calculating differences in the sound between our two ears and using that to, to navigate. Fascinating. I, there are a bunch more questions, but we're running out of time. And so I'm going to ask the, the final question that I have been asking all of our speakers recently is, why do you feel it is important for people to learn about science? Well, I can give my, um, my selfish reason, which is uh, because it's cool. Why wouldn't you? But my, my, my reason is because understanding the world around us is, you know, we only have so much time here and we can spend it doing whatever we want. So why don't we spend it trying to figure out how this place is so cool? And I think that fundamentally for me, science fills the niche of the childhood or the, it fills a place of the childhood me asking why at every single turn. Why? 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 And that's why I think science is important because I think that that question why is the most important question. And I, I applaud people who can make it through their lives without wanting to ever ask it. But I'm not one of those people. And even if the answer is, hmm, I'm happier that I asked the question. And I think that's what science is, to be happier that you asked a question and to be inquisitive than to just be okay with where things are. Why not know more? So... Yeah, we've only got one brain, might as well fill it. That's my, that's my take on it. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for this fantastic presentation. Um, I, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, but um, I, I appreciate all of the, the response in the, the Q&A and, and all of your thoughtful answers. So thank you, Dr. Kirupa Sudhakar. And um, thank you to our ASL interpreters for joining us this evening. And I am going to finish up this evening by sharing my screen again and just saying a few final words. So thank you. And let's go here. And just to let you know, um, if you are interested in science and want to know more things, this is a completely different topic, but we're going to be talking about birds at our next event. It's on Wednesday, March 10, and it's with Dr. Wenfei Tong, who um, has written a couple of books, uh, and she'll be talking about this book, Bird Love, The Family Life of Birds. And if you've been a fan of Science on Tap for any period of time, you may recognize the name Wenfei Tong because she spoke at an event 
event um, back in September on uh, understanding bird behavior, and it was fantastic. And so I've asked her to come back. And if you are a fan of our podcast, you should take a listen next Monday because I'll be posting an episode um, where I interview Wen Fei about her life and her work and, and her interest in birds. So come back and see us on Wednesday, March 10th for that talk. Also want to say thank you to our Patreon supporters. Uh, we have, we're up to 126. We gained a couple more this week, so thank you for that. And these are the folks who are uh, donating $10 or more per month. And you folks are really the backbone of what's keeping us alive here at Science on Tap. Um, if you, we are really grateful. And um, if any of you are interested in becoming a, a Patreon supporter and want to get one of our uh, Science on Tap pint glasses, um, I, I'm sending those out. I I think it's at the $20 level. So um, feel free to, to take a look at that. And thank you so much for all of you who are supporting us through that. Special thank you to one of our Patreon supporters, Carol Stewart. Appreciate you. And finally, um, th thanks for sticking around all this length uh, all the, uh, to the very end of the, the talk. Um, we are providing these events for free because we think it's important that people have an opportunity to learn about science. Um, and we're very grateful to, again, the Association for Research in Otolaryngology or ARO for providing the uh, ASL interpreters this evening so that we can make this event even more accessible to folks. But it costs money to put on and so if you have enjoyed what you like this or what you saw this evening and you feel compelled, um, we would be grateful to um, have a donation of any size, uh, even a dollar, five bucks, whatever, um, or more. That's fine, too. Um, if you go to makeyouthink.org slash support, Make You Think is our uh, nonprofit partner. Um, so your, your do donations are tax deductible. Or again, like I mentioned, you can go to our Patreon and uh, get some behind the scenes things and maybe some pint glasses and whatnot, too. So um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the ARO for helping co-sponsor this event. Um, thank you, Allie Coffin, for helping with us. And um, Thank you all for coming. Have a great evening and hope to see you at a future event. Have a good evening.